Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. The Things They Carried is a work of fiction by Tim O'Brien. This is a fictional job. The events, names, and characters, and some details from the author's own life are all fictitious. This book is dedicated to the people of Alba Company, especially to Jim Cross, Norman Bowker, Rob Kylie, Mitchell Sanders, Henry Dobbins, and Kiowa. Contents The Things They Carried, Love, Spin, On the Rainy River, Enemies, Friends, How to Tell a True World Story, The Dentist, Sweetheart of the Song Trouble, Stockings, Church, The Man I Killed, Ambush, Style, Speaking of Courage, Notes, In a Field, Good Farm, Field Trip, The Ghost Soldiers, Night Love, and The Lives of the Dead. This book is fundamentally different from any other book published by Own Late War or any of its events. Those who have experience will see its authenticity. And for all other readers, it's considered to be the true statement of the most experienced, John Ramson's Andersonville Journal. Chapter 1 The Things They Carried Lieutenant Jimmy Cross of Alpa Company carried various reminders of his love for Martha, a girl from the University of New Jersey, and she did not express her desire to return her love. Cross carried his letter in a backpack, the pebbles of good luck in his mouth. After a long day of traveling, he opened his letter, imagining the prospect of returning his love one day. Martha is an English student and her letter quoted verses and never mentioned the war. Although, the signature of these letters is love, Martha. Cross understands that this gesture should not give him false hope. He uncontrollably doubted whether Martha was a virgin. He took pictures of her, including a photo of her playing volleyball. But what was closer to his heart was her memory. They only dated once, to watch the movie Bonnie and Clyde. In the last scene, when Cross touched Martha's knee, Martha looked at him and asked him to retract his hand. Now, in Vietnam, Cross hopes he can hold her up the stairs, tie her to the bed, and touch her knees all night. He was pained by the sharp knowledge that his feelings might never be rewarded. Narrator Tim O'Brien describes what all men in a company carry. These are the most physical things, such as insecurpillion and marijuana, razors, and chewing gum. The clothes they wear depends on many factors, including men's priorities and their physique. For example, the machine gunner Henry Dobbins is very big. He carries exorations because of superstition. He puts his girlfriend's pantyhose around his neck. The nervous dead lavender brought marijuana and tranquilizer to calm himself down, while Kiowa brought an illustrated New Testament Bible, which was a gift from his father. Some men wear universal things, such as fatal injury-proof cushions and two-pound raincoats, which can be used as raincoats, awnings, or tents. Most of them are ordinary low-level soldiers, carrying standard M16 assault rainfalls and various ammunition depots. Several people are holding grenade launchers. All people carry the symbolic meaning of memory and the weight of other people's work. They take Vietnam itself in bad weather and dusty crown. What they wear is also determined by their level or profession. For example, as leader, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross is responsible for the map, the compass, in the lives of their soldiers. Army medic Rod Kiley carries morphine, malaria pills, and supplies to treat serious injuries. One day, when a company outside, Tan Ke was on a mission to destroy the tunnel complex. Cross imagined 
that the tunnel collapsed on him and Marta. On the way back to the bathroom, Lavender was shot under the load of her pool backpack, fell particularly badly. While the soldiers waited for the helicopter to remove Lavender's body, they smoked marijuana. They joked that Lavender abused sedatives and rationalized that he might be too numb to be painful when he was shot. Cross led his men to the village when the soldiers burned everything and shot dogs and chickens and then continued their march in the afternoon heat. When they stopped for the night, Cross dug a ditch in the ground and sat behind crying. At the same time, Kayawa and Norman Bauker sat in the dark, discussing the short time between life and death, trying to figure out the situation. In the silence that followed, Kayawa marveled at how quickly the lavender fell and how he zipped his pants one second before he died. He found out that the lack of trauma surrounding this death was somehow non-Christian and wondered why he could not mourn publicly like Cross did. The morning after Lavender's death in the continuous rain, Cross squatted in a trench and burned Martha's letter and two photos. He planned the march that day and concluded that he will never have any illusions anymore. He plans to gather these people and take responsibility for Lavender's death. He reminded himself that although men inevitably complain, his job is not to be loved, but to lead. Chapter 2 Love Long after the war is over, Jimmy Cross pays a visit to Tim O'Brien, and they share war experiences while drinking coffee and smoke cigarettes. After that, they switch to a bottle of gin. They look at the photographs, and Jimmy says he will never forgive himself for Lavender's death. Tim feels the same way about that. When they are both drunk, they talk about some life experiences. And when Tim asks about Martha, Jimmy is surprised that Tim remembers her. So Jimmy gets a picture of Martha and tell more about her. Jimmy show a picture of Martha, her valuable photograph. She told that Martha that they had run to each other. She was a literate missionary, a nurse that she had never married. And she said she didn't know why. When he confessed about his love, she shrugged off and she said sorry. But Martha gave him a copy of her photograph and she told me not to burn it. Jimmy laughed when he reminiscing that memory. Jimmy tells Tim that he still loves Martha, but for the rest of his visit with Tim, he doesn't speak of her. Finally, as Tim walks Jimmy to his car, he tells his former lieutenant that he would like to write a story about some of what they have spoken. After some consideration, Jimmy consents saying that maybe Martha will read it and come begging for him. He urged him to paint him as a brave and good leader. He then asked him for a favor that he not mention anything about. So Tim responds that he won't. Chapter 3 Spin Snorter admits that he's only 43 years old and is a writer who only writes about war. Although his daughter Catherine urges him to write more trivial things, the narrator always returns to the war. Interestingly, all the memories are often terrible and all the terror seems to exist in the story. War is terrible. The narrator compares the war to a painful ball that can be rotated. The narrator recalled many memories. Some were scary, some were not. Charles Sanders used his nails to remove flies and then mailed them to his shooting board. There are memories of Norman Bowker and Henry Dobbins playing checkers. This is a clear game without tunnels, mountains, or jungles. There are rules. Soldiers will gather together to watch them play. The soldiers want us an old papasan, 
to let them through the minefield. When they all survived, a helicopter came to take them away and leave the old man behind. Although the soldiers try to relax when they are not fighting, the narrator compares the anxiety of soldiers to an acid that corrodes their organs. That's how boring they feel. The narrator explains that there is a peace story in war. The soldiers told each other the story of a man who left his job without authorization, started living with a Red Cross nurse, and finally returned to war because peace was hurting him and he wanted to hurt her. Other stories of peace are just snippets, like Norman Docker admitting that he wants his father to tell him that he can return to the war without a medal. The narrator recalls that Kiowa taught Rod Kylie to dance in the rain, although Kylie was confused when it didn't start training right away. The narrator recalls how the boy Azard trapped an orphan puppy in a care of dead lavender to claim her to recover and then blew it up. The narrator reflects on the war, how the war happened a long time ago, but the memory makes it seem like it being occurred. Sometimes the memory becomes a story, and the story connects the past with the future. They exist forever, and when the memory is erased, the story still exists. Chapter 4 on the Rainy River in a attempt to relieve some shame and guilt about his involvement in the war, middle-aged writer O'Brien related a story about himself that he has never before told anyone. This is a story about the summer of 1968 when he was 21 years old and was drafted to serve in the army. Before his draft notice arrived, O'Brien had taken a mild stand against the war in the form of campaigning for the presidential campaign of anti-war advocate Trojan McCarthy and writing college newspaper editorials against the war. He recounts thoughts on receiving a draft notice, feeling that he was not suited for a war because his educational accomplishments and graduate school prospects were too great. O'Brien tell his father that his plan for the summer is to wake and work. He spent his summer working at big slaughterhouse and meat packaging plant. The work is messy and unpleasant, and O'Brien feels his life going out of control. So around mid-July, O'Brien began thinking about crossing the border into Canada to avoid the trap. He weighed the morality of this decision as he fears losing respectability, being ridiculed, and being cut by authority. When figuring O'Brien's bill, Elroy recalls the chores O'Brien had done. The site said instead he owes O'Brien money and gives him $200, O'Brien refuses the money, so he will need it if he did continue on to Canada. But Elroy packed it to O'Brien's cabin door with a note marked emergency fund. During O'Brien's last day at the lodge, Elroy takes him fishing on the river. O'Brien, the narrator, comments on the thoughts that flash through his mind. He remembers crying and feeling helpless, while Elroy just keeps on fishing pretending not to notice. O'Brien tries to force himself out of the boat and toward the Canadian shore, but cannot trimpel himself to flee to Canada. They return to the lodge and O'Brien departs for home and eventually for Vietnam. Chapter 5 Enemies One morning on patrol, Dave Jensen and Lee Strunk get into a fist fight over a missing jackknife that Jensen thinks Strunk has stolen. Jensen breaks Strunk's nose, hitting him repeatedly and without mercy. Afterward, Jensen is nervous that Strunk will try to get revenge and pays special attention to Strunk's whereabouts. Finally, crazed by apprehension, Jensen fires his gun into the air and calls out Strunk's name. Later that night, he borrows a pistol and uses it to break his own nose in order to even the score. 
The next morning, Strunk is amused by the news, admitting that he did steal Jensen's jackknife. Chapter 6 Friends Dave Jensen and Lee Strunk learn to trust each other. They resolve that if one gets seriously wounded, the other will kill him to put him out of his mercy. In October, Strunk's lower leg gets blown off by a mortar round. Jensen kneels at his side and Strunk repeatedly begs not to be killed. Strunk is loaded into a helicopter and later Jensen is relieved to learn that Strunk didn't survive the trip. Chapter 7 How to Tell a True War Story O'Brien offers a story about Red Kelly that he assures his readers is true. Red's friend, Kurt Lemon, is killed and Red writes Lemon's sister a letter. Red's letter talks about her brother and the crazy stunts he attempted. Red believes the letter is poignant and personal. However, from the Lemon sister's viewpoint, it is inappropriate and disturbing. The sister never writes back and Red is offended and angered as the reader is left to in fear at the sister never returns the letter. Auburn suggests that Lemon's sister failure to return the letter offer a kind of sad and true moral to the story. Lemon's death, an accident resulting from a game of catch with a grenade, is described in detail. Auburn remembers body parts stewed in the jungle trees and thinks about his own memories of the event. He comments that in true story it is difficult to distinguish what actually happened from what seemed to happen, again blurring the between truth and story. O'Brien offers readers the advice that they should be skeptical and offers a true story told to him by Mitchell Sanders as an example. A patrol goes into the mountains for a week-long operation to manage or enemy movement. The jungle is spooky and the men start hearing strange eerie noises which become an opera, a glee club, chanting and so on, but the voices they hear are not human. Sanders says that the mountains, trees, and rocks were making the noise, and that men called is massive firepower. He says a colonel letter asked them why, and they do not answer because they know he will not understand their story. Sanders says that the moral is that nobody listens. The next day, Sanders admit he made up a part of the story. Next, O'Brien tells what following laments that the unit comes across a baby water buffalo. Red Kelly tries to feed it but it does not eat, so Kelly steps back and shoots the animal into its knee. Though crying, he continues to shoot the buffalo aiming to hurt rather than kill it. Others dump the near dead buffalo in a well to kill it. O'Brien concludes that a true war story, like the one about the water buffalo, is never about war. These stories are about love, memory, and sorrow. Chapter 8 The Dentist O'Brien says that morning Kurt Lemon was difficult for him because he didn't know him well. But in order to avoid getting sentimental, he tells a brief Kurt Lemon story. In February, the men are at work in the area of operation along the South China Sea. One day, an army dentist is flown in to check the men's teeth. As the planton sits waiting to be checked one by one, Kurt Lemon begins to tense up. Finally, he admits that in high school he had some bad experiences with the dentist. He says that no one messes with his teeth and that when he's cold, he'll refuse to go in. However, a few moments later, when the dentist calls him, Lemon rises and goes into the tent. He faints before the dentist can even lay a finger on him. Later that night, he creeps back to the dental tent and insists that he has a killer to take, though the dentist can't find any problem. Lemon demands his tooth to be pulled. Finally, the dentist shrugging gives him a shoot and yanks perfectly good tooth out to Lemon's delight. Chapter 9 Sweetheart of the Song Trabong O'Brien recalls a story of Red Kelly's. 
the rat swears the story is true, Aubrey doubts its accuracy. He explains that Rat exaggerates not because he wants to deceive, but because he wants listeners to almost feel the story so that it seems more real. Rat had been assigned to a medical detachment near Trabong in an area that medics shared with six green berets. The group did not interact often. During an all-night drinking session, a medic jokingly mentions that the medic should pull their money and import some prostitutes from Saigon. One medic, Mark Fossey, is taken by the idea, and six weeks later his high school sweetheart, Mary Ann Bell, arrives at the compound. Young and naive, Mary Ann insists on learning about Vietnamese culture and Vietnam War up close. She assists when the medical unit receives casualties. Eventually, she stops wearing makeup, and her attention is consumed by learning how to use an M16 assault rifle. Fossey suggests that she return home, but she does not. She begins staying out late, finally staying at all night. Fossey, realizing Mary Ann is missing, wakes up red. They search for her, but do not find her. Aubrey interrupts the story to comment on how Rat told the story. Rat would step with Mary Ann's disappearance and ask where she might be. Mitchell Sanders guesses that she was with the Green Berets because Rat mentioned them. And that is how stories work. Rat would resume the story and tell his listeners that she was resting with the Green Berets in their hutch after all night ambush. The next morning, Mary Ann returns wearing green fatigues and carrying a rifle. She tells Fuzzy that they will talk later, but he is angry and will not wait. Later that day, Mary Ann appears fully groomed wearing her feminine clothes. Fuzzy explained that they officially became engaged, and the pair maintains a facade of happiness. Fuzzy makes arrangement for Mary Ann's trip home. The next morning, she disappears again with the green berries. Three weeks pass until she returns. The next day, Fuzzy waits outside the green berries area waiting to see Mary Ann. He hears an eerie human voice. Pushing inside the green berries hutch, he sees piles of bones, smells a horridon's snitch, and hears Mary Ann chanting. She tells Fuzzy that she likes this life and that he does not belong there. Red's platoon buddies dislike the abrupt ending as what happened to Mary Ann. He tells them that the rest is hearsay, but that he understands that she disappeared into the jungle. Chapter 10 Stockings Henry Dobbins is described as a good man and a great soldier, who is like America, big, strong, good intentions. He wasn't fast, had fat juggling in his belly. And he wasn't that sophisticated, but he was reliable and drawn to sentimentality. Auburn remembers how Dobbins used to keep his girlfriend's pantyhose wrapped around his neck before they went out an ambush. He said they were his good luck charm. He would breathe in her scent and said he liked the memories they brought back. Sometimes he slipped with the stockings against his face. Mostly, though the stockings were of superstitious value, Dobbins believed they keep him safe from harm. Auburn said many men in Vietnam felt a superstitious pull, and Dobbins was one of them. He believed the stockings had protective power, like body armor. He was ritualistic about the way he put them on before an ambush. Some people joke about it. But everyone came to appreciate the mystery of it all. Dobbins never got hurt, not even a scratch. In August, he tripped the wire of a bouncing Betty, which didn't detonate. A week later, he was out in the open of a firefight. He slipped the pantyhose over his nose and came out fine. Everyone in the platoon began to believe in the pantyhose. His survival was a fact so their power was fact. At the end of October, Dobbins' girlfriend broke up with him. He was quiet for a long time while he started down at the letter. 
After a while, Dobbins took out the stockings and wrapped them around his neck, claiming they will still work. The magic doesn't go away. Chapter 11 Church One afternoon, the platoon comes across an abandoned pagoda that seems to function as a church. Every day, during the men's stay there, which lasts more than a week, two monks bring them water and other goods. One day, while the monks clean and oil Dobbin's M60 machine gun, Dobbin says that though he isn't a religious man and wouldn't enjoy taking part in the sermons, he might like to join the church because he would enjoy interacting with people. Kiowa says that although he carries the Bible everywhere because he was raised too, he wouldn't enjoy being a preacher. He does say, though, that he enjoys being in a church. When the monks finish cleaning the gun, Dobbin wipes up the excess oils and hands them each a can of peaches and a chocolate bar, making a washing motion with his hands. He says that all one can do is be nice to them. Chapter 12 The Man I Killed The Man I Killed begins with a list of physical attributes and possible characteristics of the man whom Aubrey killed with a grenade in my key. Aubrey describes the wounds that he inflicted. The man's jaw was in his throat, he says, and his upper lip and teeth were missing. One eye was shut, and the other looked like a star-shaped hole. Aubrey imagines that the man he killed was born in 1946 and that his parents were farmers, that he was neither a communist nor a fighter, and that he hoped that Americans would go away. Aubrey describes the reaction of his platoon mates in Sensitive Azar compares the young man to oatmeal, shredded weed, and rice crispies, while Kiowa rationalized Aubrey's actions and urges him to take his time coming to terms with the debt. All the while, Aubrey reflects on the boy's life, cut short. He looks at the boy's sunken chest and delicate fingers and wonders if he was a scholar. He imagines that the other boys at school might have teased this boy because he may have had a woman's walk and a love for mathematics. A butterfly lands on the corpse's cheek, which causes Aubrey to notice the undamaged nose. Despite Gio was urging to pull himself together, to talk about it, and to stop staring at the body, Aubrey cannot do so. Kiowa confesses that maybe he doesn't understand what Aubrey is going through, but he rationalizes that the young man was carrying a weapon and that they are fighting a war. He asked if Aubrey would rather trade places with him. Aubrey doesn't respond to Kiowa. Aubrey notices that the young man's head is lying by tiny blue flowers and that his cheek is peeled back in three ridge strips. He imagines that the boy began studying at the university in Saigon in 1964 that he avoided politics and favored calculus. He notices that the butterfly has disappeared. Kiyo bends down to search the body, taking the young man's personal effects, including a picture of a young woman standing in front of a motorcycle. Her he rationalizes that if Aubrey had not killed him, one of the other men surely would have, but Aubrey says nothing even after Kiowa insists that the company will move out in five minutes' time. When the time has passed, Kiowa covers the body and says Aubrey looks like he might be feeling better. He urges him again to talk, but all Aubrey can think of is the boy, the internet, and his eye that looks like a star-shaped hole. Chapter 13 Ambush more than 20 years after the end of the war, 
Aubrian's daughter Kathleen asks Aubrian if he has ever killed anyone. She contends that he can't himself from obsessively writing war stories because he killed someone. Aubrian, however, insists that he has never killed anyone. Reflecting on his lie, Aubrian pretends Kathleen is an adult and imagines that he might tell her the entire story of Mickey. Aubrian recounts that in the middle of the night, the platoon, separated in two two-man teams, moved into the ambush site outside Mickey. Aubrian teamed up with Kiowa, noticed Dawn breaking slowly in slivers. As his Kiowa left, Aubrian fighting up mosquitoes, saw a young soldier wearing an ammunition belt coming out of the fog. The only reality Aubrian could feel was the sore nervousness in his stomach, and without thinking, he pulled the key in the grenade before he realized what he was doing. When the grenade bounced, the young man dropped his weapon and began to run. He then hesitated and tried to cover his head. Only then did Aubrian realize that the man was about to die. The grenade went off and the man fell on his back, his sandals blown out. Aurian grapples with his guilt. He insists that the situation was not one of life and death, and that had he had not fooled the pin in the grenade, the man would have passed by. Kiowa contended that the young one would have died anyway. Aurian states that none of it mattered. Even now, 20 years later, he still had his finish sorting it out. He says that he sees the young man coming through the pug sometimes when he's reading the newspaper or sitting alone. He imagines the young man walking up the trail, passing him, smiling at the secret thought, and continuing on his way. Chapter 14 Style Though most of our village has burned to the ground and her family has been burned to death by the American soldiers, a Vietnamese girl of 14 dances through the wreckage. The men of the platoon cannot understand why she is dancing, as her contends that the dance is a strange ritual, but Dobbins insists that the girl probably just liked to dance. Later that night, Azar mocks the girls dancing by jumping and spinning, putting his hands against his ears and then making an erotic motion with his hips. Dobbins grabs Azar from behind, carries him over to the mouth of a well, and threatens to dump him if he doesn't dance properly. Chapter 15 Speaking of Courage After the war, Norman Bowker returns to Loa. On the 4th of July, as he drives his father big Chevrolet around the lake, he realizes that he has nowhere to go. He reminisces about his high school girlfriend, Sally Kramer, who is now married. He thinks about his friends Max Arnold, who drowned in the lake. He thinks also of his father, whose greatest hopes that Norman will bring home medals from Vietnam, was satisfied. Norman won seven medals in Vietnam, including the combat in Panterman's badge, the Air Medal, the Army Commendation Medal, the Bronze Star, and the Purple Heart. He thinks about his father pride in those badges and turn recalls how he almost won the Silver Star but blew his chance. He drives around the town again and again, flicks on the radio, orders a hamburger at the A and W, and imagines telling his father the story of the way he almost won the Silver Star when the banks of the song Tra Brong overflowed. The night the platoon settled in a field along the river, a group of Vietnamese women 
ran out to discourage them, but Lieutenant Jimmy Cross showed them away. When they set up camp, they noticed a soul. Fish Lake smell. Finally, someone concluded that they had set up camp in a sewage field. Meanwhile, the rain poured down, and the earth bubbled with the heat and the excess moisture. Suddenly, rounds of mortal fell on the camp, and the field seemed to boil and explode. When the third round hit, Kiawa began screaming. Boker saw Kiawa sink into the muck and grab him by the boot to pull him out. Yet Kiawa was lost, so Bowker let him go in order to save himself from sinking deeper into the muck. Bowker wants to relate this memory to someone, but he doesn't have anyone to talk to. On his 11th trip around the lake, he imagines telling his father the story and admitting that he did not act with the courage he hoped he might have. He imagines that his father might console him with the idea of the seven medals he did win. He parks his car and wades into the lake with his clothes on, submerging himself. He then stands up, folds his arms, and watches the holiday fireworks, remarking that they are pretty good for a small town. Chapter 16 Notes Aubrey says that the speaking of courage was written at the request of Norman Bowker, who three years after the story was written, hung himself in the YMCA. Aubrey says that in 1975, right before Saigon finally collapsed, he received a 17-page handwritten letter from Bowker saying that he couldn't find a meaningful use for his life after the war. He worked several short-lived jobs and lived with his parents. At one point, he enrolled in junior college, but eventually dropped out. In his letter, Bowker told Aubrey that he had read his first book, If I Die in a Combat Zone, and that the book had brought back a great deal of memories. Bowker then suggested that Aubrey write a story about someone who feels that Vietnam robbed him of his will to live. He said he would write it himself, but he couldn't find the words. Aubrey explains that when he received Bowker's letter, he thought about how easily he transitioned from Vietnam to graduate school at Harvard University. He thought that without writing, he himself might have been paralyzed. While he was working on a new novel entitled Going After Kakiato, Aurian thought of Bowker's suggestion and began a chapter titled Speaking of Courage. But following Bowker's request, he did not use Bowker's name. He substituted his own hometown scenery for Bowker's and he omitted the story of the sewage field and the rain and Kiawa's death in favor of his own protagonist's story. The writing was easy, and he published the piece as a separate short story. Later, Aubrey realized that the false war piece had no place in going after Kakyad, a war novel, and that in order to be successful, the story would have to stand on its own in truth, no matter how much the prospect frightened Aubrey. When the story was anthologized, a year later, Aurian sent a copy to Bowker, who was upset about the absence of Kiowa. Eight months later, Bowker hung himself. A decade later, Aurian has revised the story and has come to terms with it. He says that central incident about the night on the song Trabong and the death of Kiowa has been restored. But he contends that he does not want to imply that Bowker did not have a lapse of courage that was responsible for the death of Kiowa. Chapter 17 in the Field The morning after Kiowa's death, the platoon searches the area for his body. 
Lieutenant Cross watches his men as they search and thinks about the impact of Kiowa's death. Azar makes jokes about the style of Kiowa's death, but Boker warns him to stop. Michelle Sanders and Norman Boker eventually recover Kiowa's rucksack, and they argue over who is responsible for Kiowa's death. Sanders blames Lieutenant Cross, but Boker disagrees. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Cross rehearses a letter he might write to Kiowa's father, but his thoughts wander back to his own culpability because he chose that particular field on which to camp. Lieutenant Cross wades across the field to a soldier who is shaking and sobbing. The young soldier is sorry because he thinks he may have caused Kiowa's death by accidentally signaling their presence to the enemy by switching on a flashlight. The soldier is searching for a photo of his girlfriend, and Lieutenant Cross feels pity for him. Norman Boker locates the corpse, and Mitchell Sanders warns Azar not to make any more jokes or crude comments. They finally dislodge the body from the muddy bottom of the field and are saddened and relieved. But they also felt a secret joy because they are alive. Azar feels some um, guilt over his earlier jokes. Lieutenant Cross lets himself sink into the mud and floats while he revises the letter to Kiowa's father in his mind. The upset soldiers try to confess his guilt to Lieutenant Cross, who does not listen, escaping the scene by remembering his life before the war. Chapter 18 Good Form O'Brien explains that he is a writer now and was once a soldier, but that most of the other stories comprising his memoir are invented and that he never killed the Viet Cong soldier. He explains that his style of his stories that seem to be truthful but are fiction demonstrate that story truth is truer sometimes than happening truth. O'Brien, as an author, explains that stories can be used to tell the truth or a version of it. Like when Kathleen asks O'Brien if he has ever killed a man and he says yes. Chapter 19 Field Trip O'Brien and his daughter travel to Vietnam and visit the site of Kiowa's death. O'Brien and 10-year-old Kathleen visit the tourist spots, which she enjoys. But it is clear to him that she does not understand the war that happened 20 years earlier. She wonders, why was everybody so mad at everybody else? She thinks her father is weird because he cannot forget the past. They arrive at the field where Kiowa died and O'Brien notes how it looks like any farming field now. They walk to where the field meets the river. O'Brien unwraps a cloth bundle that holds Kiowa's old moccasins. With the moccasins, he wades in, swimming out to where Kiowa's rucksack had been recovered, and reaches in and wedges the moccasins into the river bottom. O'Brien holds the glance of an old Vietnamese farmer working nearby, whom Kathleen thinks looks angry. The man holds a shovel over his head like a flag. And O'Brien tells his daughter that the anger that the man would have felt was finished and in the past. Chapter 20 The Ghost Soldiers O'Brien recalls the two times he was shot in Vietnam. The first time, Medic Rat Kylie gave him medical care in the midst of battle, checking on him four times, finally helping O'Brien to a helicopter for evacuation to a hospital. O'Brien recuperated and returned to his unit nearly a month later and found that Rat had been wounded and replaced by a new medic named Bobby Jorgensen. O'Brien was shot a second time, and he nearly died of shock before Jorgensen administered medical care. O'Brien felt intense anger toward Jorgensen. The wound developed gangrene, and O'Brien could not walk or sit. He felt humiliation and embarrassment and began planning ways to get even with Jorgensen. After his release from the hospital, O'Brien was transferred out of combat to a supply restocking area and he missed the feeling of fraternity that came from fighting alongside with friends. He continued to suffer pain from his wound. Later, his former company comes to his base for a stand-down or break from combat duties. O'Brien greets Zanders, Azar, Henry Dobbins, Dave Jensen, and Norman Boker and spends the evening drinking and talking with them. 
he begins to realize that he is no longer a member of their intimate group and becomes jealous of the friendships from which he is now excluded. O'Brien asks the others about Bobby Jorgensen. He obsesses over seeing Jorgensen, who is also on stand-down, but Mitchell Sanders advises him to give up because Bobby Jorgensen has learned how to be an excellent medic and has been accepted by the group of soldiers. O'Brien feels betrayed and becomes angry. The next morning, Jorgensen waits for O'Brien because he wants to talk to him. Jorgensen apologizes, explaining that he didn't help O'Brien because he was paralyzed by fear. O'Brien does not fully accept the apology and decides to take revenge. After being rejected by Sanders, he partners with Azar to pull a prank on Jorgensen to scare him. He later considers canceling his game but sees Jorgensen with his old friends and decides to follow him. O'Brien knows Jorgensen had night duty and plans to spook Jorgensen after dark. Azar and O'Brien string ropes attached to homemade noisemakers and tug the ropes to make frightening sounds in the darkness. O'Brien imagines Jorgensen trying to convince himself that there is no reason to be scared. He feels cruel, but he also loves and feels powerful. As O'Brien and Azar prepare for the last of their tricks, O'Brien remembers getting shot and recalls his out-of-body experience. He wishes he could stop the prank but Azar takes over. Azar continues rattling the noisemakers and manipulating a contraption made of a sandbag to look like a ghost. Jorgensen shoots the sandbag and realizes the prank, screams out O'Brien's name. Jorgensen tells Brian that he is pathetic. Azar agrees with Jorgensen and kicks O'Brien in the head. Jorgensen treats the gash on O'Brien's forehead and they decide that they are now even. Chapter 21 Nightlife Michelle Sanders tells O'Brien a story about Rat Kylie. Due to rumors of Northern Vietnamese army build-up in an area, Rat's platoon begins to move only at night and only off the main trails, struggling with the heavy foliage of the rainforest. They sleep in the day, which is difficult for Rat, who could feel tension and strain causing him at first to become quiet and then to become nervous and jumpy. He starts talking about swarms of bugs and the strange strains of bugs in Vietnam. He scratches his bug bites, clawing them and finally scratching them until they become open source. He eventually breaks down in front of Sanders, explaining that he is scared, but not normal scared. He sees pictures in his head of his fellow soldiers, but not their whole bodies only parts and organs. He begins to see his own. Finally, the tension gets to him and he shoots himself in the foot, a war wound that would rotate him out of the combat area. Lieutenant Cross says he would vouch that it was an accident and Rat is flown to Japan to recover. Chapter 22 The Loves of the Dead O'Brien explains that his stories can bring the dead back to life through the act of remembering. He describes the first dead body he saw in Vietnam, that of an old Vietnamese man. Others in the platoon spoke to the corpse in a mildly mocking way, but O'Brien could not even go near the body. The men proposed a toast to the dead man, but O'Brien would not join in. He tells Kiowa that the dead man reminded him of a girl he used to know. O'Brien then segues into the story of a particular girl named Linda. Though O'Brien was only 9 years old at that time, he believed he was in love with Linda, also age 9. He believed that their love was a mature love, not childish love. In the spring of 1956, young O'Brien escorted Linda on their first date, chaperoned by O'Brien's parents. They went to a World War II movie whose premise was tricking the Germans by dumping the corpse of a soldier in a British officer's uniform and planting misleading documents on him. The premise upset O'Brien but he saw Linda smiling at the screen. Linda began wearing the red cap she wore on their day to school and her classmates teased her about it. O'Brien wishes that he would have stood up to her main investigator, Nick Venov, but he didn't. During class, Nick returned to his desk after sharpening his pencil and deliberately pulled off Linda's cap. Most of her hair was gone, and she wore a large bandage covering stitches across the back of her head. 
Linda suffered from a tumor in her brain, and she lived only through that summer. Nick told O'Brien that she had died, and O'Brien left his school and went home. At home, he closed his eyes and tried to make her come back to life. In his mind, he saw her, and she was healthy. She asked him why he was crying, and he answered that it was because she was dead. She told him to stop crying because it did not matter. O'Brien then recalls how in Vietnam they had also had ways to make the dead seem alive again through the way they walked and thought about the dead. They kept the dead alive with stories, like the stories of Ted Lavender's death and those Rat Kylie told and embellished. Returning to his memory of Linda, O'Brien describes how his father took him to the funeral home to view the body. O'Brien recalls how he made up stories so that Linda would appear in his dreams. They would talk and walk and ice skate in his dreams, and Linda would offer insights into life and death. At the age of 43, O'Brien still dreams Linda alive and he can see her in his dreams, as he can see Kiowa and Ted Lavender and others. Middle-aged Brian, a successful writer, realizes that he is trying to save his childhood self, Timmy with a story. Group 7 Vietnam Alexis Cadden Charbelita Dantes Jinky Handeman Rochelle Magat